Really interested to hear our next guest answer. <laughs> uh, uh, she's not only an activist, but a true fashion pioneer. Sinead Burke is a total trailblazer in the world of fashion. Born with achondroplasia, a genetic condition which causes restricted growth, Sinead made history as the first ever visibly disabled person to feature on the front cover of British Vogue in 2019 and then again in 2023. She's worked with some of the world's most famous faces and got a prestigious invite to the Met Gala. Now Sinead is focused on working with global brands to make day-to-day -day life more accessible for everyone. Please welcome Sinead Burke. Yeah. I mean, you're like this fashion icon. As I was watching all of the outfits, I said to you, I was like, oh my gosh, your style is amazing. I mean, has, have the last few years, what, what has it been like? Has it been like a bit of a whirlwind with everything that's happened? It's incredible and humbling and embarrassing and surreal to <laughs> see that VT back. But, you know, I think about the very early days of being a teenager, being so visibly different and being disabled. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways then, I believe that fashion was this powerful vocabulary, that if I sit in front of you in whatever outfit I might wear, that could challenge people's perceptions, or in many ways, I think, mm -hmm. unpick the stigma that mm -hmm. often exists or the ableism that's present in society around disability. And I'm so proud of so many of the things that I've been able to achieve, you know, whether it is being the first little person to be on the cover of Vogue. But I also acknowledge that that was in 2019. And while you get to be the first, it's your absolute responsibility to make sure that you're not the last. Yeah. It's so interesting to say that. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. You, you go on, because I know what you're going to say. Go on. I, I, listen, I'm so proud of you. That's what I want to say. I'm so, so proud of you, because it takes so much courage to be the first to anything, so mm. hats off to you. But what I want to ask you is about the challenges that you find when you're dealing with brands or yeah. businesses, and you're looking at making those changes to make businesses, public spaces accessible. I just want to, sh what, if you could share with our sure. audience what that, what those challenges are like. Yeah. Please don't get teary because I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's probably useful to, to say that, you know, I had no idea even five years ago that I would set up a business to try to tackle some of these challenges. But the reality is, is because of what we've all been through. So if I think about the pandemic, it's not that long ago. And in the first wave of the pandemic, six out of 10 people who died here in England of COVID-19 were disabled. Wow. And we as a society created a whole other language. We asked, well, did they have underlying conditions? Mm. Were they vulnerable? As if it was more acceptable that they no longer existed. Mm -hmm. And in the pandemic, I remember thinking, you know, I can open the doors of my wardrobes and have beautiful clothes, but they are only available to me. And it asked the question, did the fashion industry become more accessible because I was part of it? Or did it become more accessible for me? Mm. And mm. the honest answer, I think, is that there are changes that I was and am still proud of, but actually what you need is a catalyst. Mm. So setting up a business, and I created Tilting the Lens to think about actually if visibility alone is not the only measure of success in terms of opportunities, even yeah. sitting in panels mm -hmm. like this, that actually, what does the work look like? What does it look like to create system change in fashion and beyond? And I think about some of the projects and, you know, the barriers are numerous. But if I think about people who are blind and low vision, who want to access retail stores and spaces, one of the projects that we've got to be part of is we put in assistive technology called Ira, A-I or A. And if you are blind, you log into this app, you're connected with a real life person, the person has permission to access the back camera of your phone and navigate you through a space. Wow. So let's say that you wanna have a look at the shoes, but you don't know where they are. And actually inaccessibility means that so often we opt out of participating. Yeah. We don't push open the door. We don't say yes to our friends who invite us out for dinner because there's so many barriers. Yeah. So what are the ways in which we can create those radical invitations? Should it, should it be just about somebody who has a disability solely sort of trying to push through those barriers? Should those who also don't have a disability should be able to see the barriers and try and instigate change as well? Mm. I think it's such an important question, right? And whether we think about all of the issues that are in place in the world, right? I think about whether it is racism, ableism, et cetera. It requires all of us. It requires an intersectional approach. But so often, you know, we did this project around nightlife. 
when we think about accessibility or disability, so often we think about education, employment, housing, really, really important things. But we really think about joy. We really think about that disabled people need and want to have joy and pride mm -hmm. and community. And some of the biggest solutions were just information. That if it's a, a venue or a nightclub, how many steps up into the entrance? Mm, yeah. Is there a lower bar? Is yeah. there a quiet room if you're neurodivergent? Is there an accessible bathroom that doesn't have a mop bucket in it or somebody's bicycle? Mm. And actually, how can we all access that information? But to your point, it's up to all of us, right? Yeah. I think about even growing up and being, you know, a young adult and friends inviting me for dinner and always having to be the person to ask, is there a footstool? Does it have step-free access? Are we going to be sitting on the second floor? Yeah. And it's about how do we mobilize our friends to be asking these questions day yeah. to day? And, you know, to give you a trite example, if anybody's friends with a vegan, we've gotten better yeah. Yeah. at, you know, making sure that we're selecting places that have those considerations in mind. Mm -hmm. And it's the same skill, but I think sometimes when it comes to disability and accessibility, we have this nervousness. Mm -hmm. We have this deep fear of what we think is upsetting people. But I think the fear is sometimes being embarrassed. Mm. Being embarrassed at the illustration that we don't know what we don't know. Mm. Whereas actually, how do we remove ourselves from that discomfort mm. and realize that actually by asking better questions, by having conversations, yeah. we can just include yeah. as many people as possible. When you was, you know, you talk about one, I read that you was talking about one of your biggest role models is your dad. Yeah. And do you feel like that kind of pushed you and propelled you into making sure you could advocate because your dad also is seen as a little person who's yeah. got the same disability as you? I mean, my dad's watching. He's going to be deeply embarrassed now Hi, that I'm dad! talking about it. <laughs> All I'll say is I really hope he's watching. <laughs> if he has to watch this on the player. But, you know, 80% of little people are born to two average height parents. Mm. So growing up, having my dad as a very physical role model mm. of all that was possible. But I also looked to my mom, who is an incredible ally. And they founded Little People of Ireland when I was seven years old and created this community. But, you know, my dad and my mom always you know, if something was too difficult or if other people thought that I couldn't do it, they always said, you know, you'll just find a different way. That yeah. doesn't make your route yeah. less yeah. valid, exactly. less viable. Yeah. And I think I have taken those skills with me into my work now because, mm. you know, what is accessible to one person may be inaccessible yeah, to, to another, another, but how do we find as many solutions as possible mm, yeah. for as many different types of mm. people? So yeah. I'm very grateful. Yeah. Now, um, we're going to be talking about Naomi Campbell later yes. because she was talking about people labelling her as tricky and the reasons behind that. And when you're sort of trying to instigate change and trying to open the, the world's eyes yeah. to, to, you know, equality, really, does anyone ever label you as being tricky? Not to me, face. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it differs, right? If I'm being really honest, it depends of if I'm in a professional or a personal circumstance. If I am working on a project and I am thinking about the best possible access for as many people as possible, I'm really strident. Yeah. I'm really firm that this is what needs to happen, mm. even if it's something that I'm not going to benefit from. But even thinking about today, right? I'm sat here at this amazing loose women table. And even in the prep for getting onto the seat, right, we went to an ad break so that I'm sitting in the seat, you don't see me climbing on. Even thinking about how I got onto this seat, there was two boxes. But when we were doing the kind of trial run earlier, I had this moment where I was like, oh, is it okay if we have two boxes to help me? Mm. And that wasn't anything anybody said mm. or did, but it goes back to the ableism mm. in society yeah. that actually mm. I don't want the talking point to be she was nice, but like she needed two boxes. But the reality mm. is this table's not designed for me. This yeah. chair is mm. not designed for me. And that is not my fault. Mm -hmm. That is society's understanding of design. Mm -hmm. And actually, to that point about being difficult, I have to spend so much energy advocating for myself that actually what we need is the world to be designed better for everybody so that people can just show up and be loose women. <laughs> and we love the fact Stand up once again to be a part of our Lisa Women panel because I think there are so many people that have taken so much mm. from this chat. So, Sinead, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>